Well, good morning. First, I'm going to ask if you can hear me, especially the people in the back. Now, those who know me know I like to walk around, but I will stay anchored to this spot if it's the place where you can hear. Well, I'm delighted to be here and delighted to see so many of you here today. Uh, Sam is right. We were at rival institutions, but we were also at institutions who valued early childhood. And I have to say that one of the reasons why I came to Nebraska was because I saw a whole university that really was beginning to make lots of strides forward in early childhood. And that was not simply the university, it was the state as a whole. So I feel very privileged and very honored to be part of the Nebraska Initiative. I would like to just take a moment before I begin telling you about the report to tell you a little bit about how it came about. Now I know we've been laughing because it's kind of like a brick, you know, it's a really thick thing. But last night I went home and uh, I had occasion to uh, go through some old books that I had and I found my first textbook, I won't tell you what year, from college uh, by Musson, Conger, and Kagan, and some people may recognize those names, um, if you have hair like mine. <laughs> and uh, it was a thick book, too. But when I looked at the references, and there were tons of references, we felt very scholarly with that book. What I came to realize is that book was filled with theory. I learned a lot about theory as a child development student. I learned about Piaget's theory, I learned about Kohlberg's theory, I learned about uh, Gazelle's theory. I mean, I learned a lot about theory. But I have to tell you that looking back today, not many of those studies, not many of those references had any real data behind them. They were filled with lots of people's good ideas, a lot of philosophy about child development. And they were good, solid things to be thinking about. The reason this book is so thick is it's filled with the science of child development. And I'm so proud of the fact that in 1970, mm -mm, it would have been a book about this thick that was really the data-based portion of the field. So look how far our field has come that we can produce something so big that's really filled with data-based information. Now I want to tell you a little bit about the process of this because as I look around the room, I see lots of people that I know and certainly I would hope you would trust me as I tell you about this, but really that's not good enough. You have to have some assurance that the information that you're getting is accurate and the best that we know today. And that it came about through a process that involved a lot of people with a lot of background in research and in evidence-based practice. So first I should tell you that the committee was made up of a lot of wonderful people, obviously, but people who came from very different backgrounds. We had people who, were, who saw themselves as early childhood educators, who probably started in a classroom somewhere. Uh, but we also had people who saw themselves as early childhood scientists, who perhaps had not been in classrooms, but who had studied children and families in a variety of settings. We had people who came from the research environment, the, the private research environment, the public research environment, the university and college environment, the not-for-profit environment, and a number of other kinds of organizations. Some were even people who had created their own businesses. Uh, and we had a variety of political persuasions. Um, we had 
very conservative folks over here, or people we might label as very conservative. And we had people over here who definitely were on the much more liberal end. And we had all kinds of people in between. All of us came with opinions. All of us had ideas about what was good for kids and their families. But we had to put all of that aside. We spent the first two days of the meeting being told all the rules of how we had to engage in the discussion. So because of that, and I have Jacqueline in the room who's keeping tabs on me, just as I kept tabs on her yesterday, I'm not allowed to tell you what we talked about. And the reason for that is so that people could really explore issues down to the smallest detail without any fear that this would come to haunt them a year later in some newspaper article about this person said this or this person said that. As a result, we kind of had to peel away the onion in order to really get to the essence of what the research tells us and how we understood the research. And I have to tell you that if it was true for the others as it was for me, some of my cherished beliefs about child development were challenged. Some of the things that I held dear as philosophies were, in fact, philosophies and might not be so supported by the research. So it was a kind of a process that really, pro there, it wasn't a political process in that sense. Our job wasn't to convince somebody across the table to agree with us philosophically. Our job was to continually challenge our understanding of the research. So I'm telling you that so that when I talk to you today, that you realize I'm not just representing myself. I'm trying as best I can to represent the science that is presented in this very fat book. I do wish, I, this is now my personal thing, I wish it was a little more accessible in the sense that perhaps we had some short briefing papers and things. And I do believe the Institute of Medicine is thinking about how to disseminate this so that it's a little more reader friendly. But for the field itself, probably this is just right. Because it says, guess what? We have science behind us. We have science to inform our thinking and our decision making. So I thought as somebody who came to the committee from Nebraska that you might like to know that all the voices at the table were treated equally. All the voices at the table were heard in one way or another, even when it was uncomfortable. So that's my little disclaimer about all of this. So let's get into what the report tells us about higher education. Now yesterday you had a chance to see the abbreviated statement of task. And the whole idea was to look at the science of children's health, learning, and development, and to use that to inform workforce practice. But I want to draw your attention to those three areas, health, learning and development. I think it's very comfortable for us as a field to talk about learning and development. It is, we tend to treat health as an aside or as somebody else's part of the puzzle. But in this particular set of recommendations, health is very important too. So it's health, development, and learning, looking at children from birth to age eight. Now I'm going to ask you to do me a favor and think about how times have changed. And I want you to jot down on a piece of paper or something in front of you, something that used to be impossible. And I'll give you an example, but now it's not impossible. So for example, it used to be impossible to cross the country in a single day, and now it's not. 
what are the things you can think of that used to be impossible, but now it's not? And you have two minutes. Something that's impossible, but now it's not. And everyone must participate. <laughs> Take care of that. Okay. Now turn to people at your table and tell them what you thought of. All right, I'm going to interrupt you. <laughs> ding, ding. <laughs> okay. <laughs> Do you have a bell? Good. Oh, that was so good. Better than a microphone. Okay. So let me hear just a couple, just a couple. What was it that it used to be impossible to do that now it is not? Ask Siri. Ask Siri. Ask Siri. Good one. How about another one? Pictures from Mars. There was a hand back here. Yeah. We can talk to people across the globe as though they were sitting in that building next door. Great. One last one. <laughs> Unlock your car without having to dig for your keys. Oh, you're good. You're good. OK. Well, in this report, it is a call for change. It is a call for change. And I'd like to point out this quote from Nelson Mandela. It always seems impossible until it's done. And so as you think about what I'm going to share with you today, some of this may sound impossible. I don't think it is any more than the things you've described. It is not impossible once it's done. And Nelson Mandela also said, that, also said that education is the most powerful weapon you can use to change the world, and that's what we're all about here, education. So I said it was impossible to put a person on the moon, to prove your innocence based on your DNA, to vote if you were black, to marry your same-sex partner, to travel underneath the sea. All of those things we once thought were impossible are now possible. Okay. So in looking at this report, there was a vision. And this is it, that the vision was for the care and education workforce from, for children birth to age eight to be unified by a foundation of science on child development and early learning, shared knowledge, shared competencies, and principles to support quality professional practice. And as a result, every child would have access to high quality learning in their lives. And higher education is front and center in this process. And I was asked to talk about strategies three, four, and five, all of which are about higher education. 
And our job in higher education is obviously to produce the people who work professionally with young children, to foster support for that professional workforce beyond their time with us, but their actual beginnings in their profession, and to promote best practices among diverse professions. I noticed that yesterday when we were talking about early childhood, we were very focused on the age span of birth to age eight. And so that's certainly one of the continuums that's addressed by this report, going all the way from birth or really from the prenatal time to age eight. It also spans the settings in which we educate children. Child care set, the home setting, child care settings, preschool settings, kindergarten settings, grade school settings. So it's that continuum as well. But actually it's even bigger than that. It is the ecosystem to which young children, in which young children find themselves over time. That includes health settings. That includes, in some cases, settings that involve social workers, mental health professionals. In other words, the whole allied health part of the ecosystem is very important, as well as the home setting, the financial settings in which children and families find themselves, as well as the family setting. So the point is, this is big. And we kind of laugh, I have to admit, I didn't put the graphic up there, just like Jacqueline kind of skipped over it, that showed the ecosystem of the child. Because my goodness, it's in teeny tiny print and it's in the back of the book. But the point of it is, is there's a lot of people in this. It is complicated. And it's one of those things that's messy. You know, James Garbarino once talked about the challenges of working in this environment. And he said our tendency is to go for simple solutions. You know, don't bother me with too many facts, just get me down to the solution and we'll just go out there and do it. But the point of the fact is early childhood beyond the, within and beyond the family is big and it's complex. It involves a lot of people and a lot of resources. And higher education's role is front and center. Now, when we talk about transforming anything, it means action. That means that higher ed has to get their hands dirty. Up until now, almost every report that has come out about early childhood has come out with higher ed being able to digest the information and put it back out to our students or think about it in our research. But in all honesty, mostly it's been, here's what you people should do. You know, our job, we're, we're kind of the translators, we're the scribes, but you people out there, everybody else, you know, roll your sleeves up and start doing this work. This report's different. And some of you may recognize, if you're in the front, this Pogo cartoon. I looked it up. Have you heard that saying, we have met the enemy and it is us? Well, this is actually the original where that came from. And it's because uh, it had to do with recycling and nature. And uh, they're out in the forest and they're saying, gosh, it's, it's my, my, it's getting my, the, the beauty of the forest primeval gets me in the heart. And the little character here says, well, it's getting in my feet. And then they show a wooded glen filled with trash. And he says, boy, it's hard working on this stuff. And he says, yes, son, we have met the enemy and he is us. So we have to be very careful in higher ed to recognize that we are part of the problem we are also part of the solution. We can't just point to everybody else. I see what you mean about the delay. OK, so there were three recommendations that specifically focus on higher education. Recommendation three 
is that we need to strengthen practice-based qualification requirements for all lead educators working with children birth to age eight. And notice this is specifically focused on lead educators. It doesn't mean that all of the people aren't important, but it's saying at this time in history, there is a particular emphasis on that lead teacher, that lead practitioner, and that higher education has a role to play in this. Now, there, the rationale for this is that we really need to think about field experiences and that we need to recognize, as you saw yesterday, there's quite a variety in the kinds of experiences that our students have. But we know that the best practitioners are those who have a chance to learn their skill and apply their knowledge under guided supervision with an opportunity to reflect on that practice. We know that they need good supervisors, supervisors in the field, supervisors in higher ed, and we also know that those placements need to be diverse. Yesterday, a lot of our focus on diversity had to do with age, and that is certainly very important. But we need diversity along many dimensions. We need diversity related to socioeconomic background. We need diversity related to culture and ethnicity. We need diversity in terms of location, uh, urban, rural, suburban. So we need to really think about those three things supervised practice, well, one, practice, second, supervised, and third, diversity. But here's the challenges that we face. In reality, nationally, there is no standardization of what those experiences are like. And as you heard yesterday, they could range from a nine-hour experience to a 150-hour experience. We know that these practice experiences can vary widely by training program and professional role. There are no set standards for the setting, the length of the placement, or the content that is to be covered. So I know, for example, for 14 years, I supervised students in the field. And we thought we had pretty good standards for instance, we made sure that lead teachers that were going to supervise these students had at least three years of experience. We made sure that nobody used them just at the copy machine. Uh, we made sure that people didn't just take our students and plop them into vacation slots for staff. I mean, we really worked hard at that. But the point was, we had to work hard at that because we had placements where we would find our student at the copy machine. Or we would find that our student was in five different classrooms, not being supervised, but taking the place of the teachers who were on vacation or sick leave. That hasn't changed in many places. So we don't have a standardized code of what makes a high quality experience. And many practitioners, in particular, enter infant-toddler classrooms with no experience at all. Well, they're just babies. Anybody can take care of a baby. And this is true from the infant-toddler level through K-3. Student teaching varies greatly in all of those age groups. So there were recommendations that were made. And one of the things we're going to ask you to think about here in Nebraska, for all of us to think about, is if our goal is to have high quality supervised practice experiences for our students, what should they look like? And now let me say, when I'm talking about our students, I mean all the way from birth to age eight, I mean childcare, I mean K-third, I mean social work, I mean pediat pediatrics, I mean pediatric nursing, mental infant mental health, counseling. In other words, if you're going to work with infants 
and young families, and you've never practiced that as a counselor, how can you really do that if most of your experience has been with youth from 14 to 16 years old? We have a lot of people learning on the job. I don't mean they're not well trained. I don't mean that we haven't done our best for them. But I am saying what the research tells us is in early childhood, we have a lot of people who have not experienced the age until they get out there to do the job. If I could just say this, one of the most rewarding experiences I had at Michigan State when I ran the lab school is that our human medicine uh, college came to us and asked if their residents could be placed in our lab school for six weeks. And the residents wondered about this because no one in the lab school was really sick. And they thought that this was going to be a pretty Mickey Mouse experience. And then we put them in classrooms with 20 little three-year-olds who could walk and talk and get out the door. And they found it was a challenge. And we found that in that program, these were all going to be general practitioners. Who was, they were going to be the front line for many families who would come and ask them child development questions. Yet many of them were single. Many of them had never experienced a mobile, talkative two, three, four, or five-year-old before in their lives. So that's part of what this is about, too. So let's not put this in too small of a box. Let's recognize it for what it is. It's across the age span, and it's across the professions. So here are some of the recommendations. I'm not going to read them all to you. You will get the thumbnails for this. But the point is that one of the recommendations is that we need to develop national, state, and local standards for implementing guided practicum experiences for students of all kinds. We need to develop a greater number and diversity of field placements capable of providing relevant professional experience. And we need to make a difference between people who are acquiring this because at the beginner stage and people who are coming to us with experience, but not experience with this age group. So we have to think about these kinds of things. So that's recommendation. Uh, this is everything, or some things related to standard number three. So not only do we need to think about practice, and notice that, that's that that was strategy number three. So how important this committee felt that guided practice really was. So here's uh, strategy or recommendation number four, and it has to do with the foundation, an interdisciplinary foundation of child development. That sounds easy, doesn't it? Interdisciplinary foundation in child development. Well, we do mean that we want to know that Part of this involves understanding child development through many lenses, a health lens, a development lens, a learning lens, and it also means across the disciplines. So the rationale for this is that we know if we have fundamental shared knowledge and related competencies, among the professions in education, the social services, and allied health, we believe that that will improve the kinds of the, the professional workforce and the quality of interactions and experiences that children and their family have. We believe that it will provide consistency across the knowledge base and that it will enhance communication across the disciplines. Now here's the challenge that we face with all of that. Surprise, there are professional silos. And those silos are true across institutions, across departments, across programs, and across disciplines. If I could diverge for a moment, my own opinion here. 
Uh, for many years, I was in a college of human ecology, and my area was health and child development. And I looked at the people over in the College of Education, and I pointed my finger at them plenty of times for all the things that I thought that they should know better and do better. I was pretty sure I had the answers for them. Then I came to Nebraska, and my first couple years was in a college just like that. Then guess what? We put everybody together. And I learned that them was me. Them was us. And I had some humbling experiences in the sense of learning how very much everybody wanted to do what was absolutely the best for young kids. But everybody went at it in lots of different ways. Lots of different ways. So our challenge is that not only do we have these silos, those silos were created not because people don't care or are disrespectful from one another intuitively, but because the training that gets you to higher ed is very specific. And part of what we reward in higher ed is the more specific, the more expertise you've got, the higher you rise in your own field. As a result, it is harder to talk across the disciplines, mostly because we don't see each other. We don't take classes together. We have different philosophies, different histories, different heroes and heroines. Who are the big people in our field? If we were to look at social work, if we were to look at nursing, if we were to look at pediatrics and law and child care and elementary education, I can guarantee we could make big lists of people that we lionize in our fields and there would be very little overlap. So we don't have shared vocabulary. Sometimes we're talking about the same thing and we don't even know it. Because why? If you're a really good theorist, you create your own vocabulary to fit your own theory. And that's good. Because part of what happens in research is we fight it out as whose theory is going to come out on top. And that isn't bad. I want to make it very clear this isn't a bad thing. Because that's how we keep honing and we keep getting to truth. We keep getting to better understandings. But it is also true that it keeps us apart. It makes it harder for us to talk to one another. We have different research traditions, and we have different paths to matriculation. One of the things that I have learned over my years in higher ed is a futile battle. My science is better than your science. And those things keep our fields apart. And in doing that, it makes it harder for us then to come together on behalf of children and families. And we heard that in the public hearings over and over and over again. Not just in higher ed. So I want to be careful here. This isn't some big condemnation of higher education. It's how we approach the disciplines in general. So we heard physicians say, I don't know how to talk to the social worker. We heard kindergarten teachers say, it's really hard for me to figure out how to talk to the family development specialist. Or we had people say, I need to talk to somebody who knows about infant, me infant mental health, but I don't even know who that is in my community. That's what we're talking about, that kind of separation. So here are some recommendations. It's not all gloom and doom. There are opportunities to make this better. One is to make sure that this science of child development is at the base of all those professions, and that it's really the science of it. And that we create foundations in the preparation period of our students that help them recognize and value the professions that are really part of that mesosystem, that's part of that ecosystemic view of children and families. 
So we need some core requirements. So in my college, we have child development, and they have it over in the psych department, and they have it over in social work, and they have it over in the nursing school. Well, one of the recommendations might be that we have big sections of child development, team taught by people from varying professions to students who aspire to different pathways. Now, I already know there's 101 arguments against that. And as a dean, I can tell you a lot of them have to do with money and how you assign people and all of that. But remember the impossible thing? Just keep that one in mind. We need to also fund some initiatives to let higher education figure out how to do this. Because it's very hard to just do it out of your regular old budget. Because your budget isn't designed for that kind of experimentation, budgets are designed for delivery of courses. Or budgets are designed for certain other kinds of tasks. And we need accreditors, people who accredit us, to think more in a more interdisciplinary way. We have 12 accredited programs in our college, and I can tell you that athletic training doesn't ask a darn thing about early childhood, but it could. It could. So we need help inside the academy, but we also need people beyond the academy to be thinking about that future generation of professionals that are coming their way and really what would be best for kids and families. This is recommendation number five, the last one that I was responsible for. <laughs> and this is to ensure and document knowledge acquisition and the development of competencies needed for quality professional practice. So we want to really look at our programs and look at them in this broad way that we've talked about. The rationale is that we want to, uh, I realize what I just did. Really, there, we, the recommendation is to develop and enhance the competence of, uh, and the programs. And the second then is to document that knowledge. I apologize for that. But here's our challenge, that we have a lack of alignment between content, curriculum, and pedagogy with the core knowledge and competencies identified in the science. We still have folks uh, and programs in which there is a mismatch between what people are learning and what the science actually tells us. So here are some sample recommendations. And that is that we need to enhance the content of higher education programs. We need to have integrated study of child development, early learning, subject matter content, instructional practices, field experiences, and methods. In other words, the whole big picture needs to be integrated in a more cohesive way. If you are going to be if your career aspiration is to be working with infants and toddlers, that's great. But you know, infants and toddlers grow up, and it would be good to know where they're going. If your aspiration is to be a third grade teacher, and trust me, we have students who can tell me I'm going to be a third grade teacher, and I'm going to be a third grade teacher in Blair, and I'm going to be a third grade teacher in this school in that room. They're pretty determined about that. But they, they're looking at working with eight-year-olds. They need to know where they've come from. So one of the things we really have to do is have this broad notion of how we train our students. Second, or the, another piece of this, is we also have to give them practice with that variety of age group, with that variety of setting. And we have to let them rub shoulders with other professionals who are working with that same age group. And it feels like a lot to stuff in to programs. But we really do have to think about it. We do. We know, for example, something as simple as people in 
in general education, speaking to special education can sometimes be a challenge. We really have to figure out how. It isn't just, OK, we've trained you the best we can. Go forth. We really have to think, have we trained you the best we can if, in fact, we haven't taught you to at least talk to one or two other professions whom you will likely encounter in the community? Now, this all sounds fine, maybe. But some of the strategies that would improve, and this is now my opinion, that would improve workforce preparation are actually at odds with how we practice in higher ed. How do we work? Solo teaching, individual appointments. You work within your own program. We create field placements only in one's own discipline. And we create very specialized problem solvers. And we see that as expertise. That's how we define expertise. But here's what the report recommends. Team teaching, joint appointments for faculty, working across programs, departments, institutions, working in community sites not generally associated with the discipline. One of the things that attracted me to UNL that made me really excited was when I learned that elementary education students had a, had a turn to work in community action programs. They got a chance to see what happened in the hours the kids weren't in school. I thought that was a really innovative thing that, that this particular institution did. And I bet you can give examples of that from all the various institutions. We need more of that. And we need broadly trained problem solvers. Well, I was smiling yesterday when we had our first working group because we did think of lots of reasons why X proposal was good, but the challenges were really easy. We could think of lots of them. And there are lots of institutional challenges. We don't have much alignment from birth to age eight, not much formal alignment. Often those alignments are based on people's personal relationships. If you have a good relationship with the person who teaches special ed, you are more likely to incorporate that content in the child care side of things, or however it might be. We're territorial, just a tad. We're worried that someone else will get more money, more people, more resources than us, and we need to protect that. And I don't just mean we as administrators. I mean everybody worries about that. Because you, you want to excel in your area. We have, a lot, we have a lack of birth to age four or five experience in traditional K-12 programs, but we also lack K-12 experience in the traditional birth to age five programs. We lack high quality placements, and we heard this yesterday. I have a lot of folks who come to me, and we're very lucky here in Nebraska. I thank people all the time for giving us such great schools and great programs to put our students in, but there's not enough. We need more really high quality placement to put students in, and that's one of the things the study found. We have lack of qualified supervisors, people who have the degree to which the student aspires. And it's costly to add field experiences. We'd love to add more field experiences in many of our programs, but it means we have to come up with new supervisors, mileage, all kinds of things. And we have a tendency to tinker. In other words, how do we fix things? We change an objective in a course. We add a reading. We, we tinker. It's what I call the good to great syndrome. We're pretty good, actually. And I think we should take this to heart, particularly in Nebraska, because we are pretty good. We do good things, but sometimes good gets in the way of being great. And by that, it means we have to take risks. And sometimes when you take risks, you don't succeed. So that's institutional. But they don't end there. There's cultural ones, too. So early childhood education, special education, and elementary education often function independently. 
Um, the programs are in different units. We have difference in vocabulary. As I said, we don't always have the same heroes. We don't read the same literature. Uh, the traditions, I got to be one of the people on the report who looked a lot at history. And I have to admit, the histories of those fields came from very different places and influence where they are now. There's a big worry about down the push of the curriculum coming down. But there's also worry that we're not preparing children in those early ages so that people in K-12 can actually work with them effectively. And then finally, there are the academic constraints. So I just wanted you to know we really thought about a lot of stuff that's going to get in the way of this. We weren't naive. The committee was not naive. Right now in Nebraska, most programs, it's 120 credit limit. limit. So how do we put this, all of this in? a program at 120 credits. We are also being pushed big time to get those students out, undergraduates in particular, get them out in four years. I mean, the report card from the federal government is all about how, what is our graduation rate and are we moving students through the program. We've got a high demand for school placements at all levels and they are hard to fill. We don't get a lot of operating dollars. I've decided that in every state, whenever its state institution was founded, that's your budget and that's it. 1865 or something. We are being asked to do a lot of things we didn't used to have to do. One of them is labor intensive criminal history checks. A lot of us are paying, we have a whole person that that's all they do. And that wasn't true 10 years ago. Lack of faculty to cover depth and breadth. A lot of us, because we don't, we don't have unlimited resources, one person that teaches this, one person that teaches that. So it's really hard to give somebody up to joint teach something, because we need them to teach the one thing we hired them for. And lack of faculty with integrated perspective. So how do we cross the chasm? Well, I'll tell you one thing, we don't just take one step forward. <laughs> that won't work. That won't work. Instead, we really have to take a leap, a leap. And I'm talking now to particularly to higher ed. We do have to establish cross-institutional relationships that bolster the quality, availability, and accessibility of higher education. And these are recommendations that are in the report and you can find them there. So we need to develop professional learning communities that really cross the disciplines and cross departments. We need to incentivize cross department preparation. In other words, the early childhood program is not likely best served being in only one spot. So early childhood is really a virtual, it's a big challenge. And we need a virtual faculty who can help approach that challenge. We need people in ed ed. We need people in special ed. We need people in elementary ed. We need people in traditional child and youth development. We need people in nutrition. We need people who understand economics. We need people in psychology and sociology and anthropology. All of those people to help us think about early childhood. And certainly they're in their disciplines and their fields, but they also can see themselves as a virtual team working on these things. A Couple of other strategies are to educate doctoral students as future faculty to exhibit blended competence. And I would put a star by this, because this would be really hard, because it goes against the grain. It goes against what we're taught, which is go drill down deep. And this is saying, go wide. Go wide. Now, do we want everyone to be like this? No. But do we need some people like this? Absolutely. Absolutely. We also want to make sure that across our disciplines, we integrate experiences and we, uh, across not only settings and age groups, um, but also populations that are served. And finally, we need to educate school leaders to administer early childhood programs birth to age eight. So it's the professions at all levels. 
finally, we need to have some research that focuses on this. For example, and I realize I'm close, to, I'm at the end of my time, but let me just say, you know, we tried this in our new college. We tried an introductory course at the 200 level for second semester freshmen and sophomores where they would be with all of the professions in the college so they could learn about each other and respect each other. They hated it. They hated it. And one reason why they hated it is they didn't know enough about their aspiring professions to really come in and be able to talk knowledgeably. So they had every stereotype on earth about one another. We hadn't hit it right. We didn't, the double Dutch example from yesterday, we weren't in the right place. We got the jump rope really tangled around our feet. We even had a website called I Hate CEH 200. Oh, yeah. <laughs> I'm sharing that because this was really a pretty good course, but we didn't have it in a good spot. Okay, but here are some research questions. How well do bachelor level students integrate principles learned in one age group to other age groups? So if they learn about child guidance with infant toddlers, how well do they apply that with kindergartners? How well do bachelor level teachers from blended programs meet the needs of schools and children with special needs? Another one is what add-on specializations might be needed at the post-bachelor's level to cover the entire age range? These are just some samples, but these are things we need research about. Not just ask, but we need research. One last thing, in the academy, we have to differentiate between academic time and real time. If we propose something in higher ed, I can guarantee that an academic committee will say, well, right away, it's going to take at least a year. Figure that one out, or two or three. Things are shifting under our feet. If we want to change, one way we could look at it is it's climate change and the glaciers are melting. But I think it is, in fact, real time is a tsunami of change is coming to higher ed. We have a window of opportunity, but we have to be careful not to squander it. Because this change that is coming will envelop us in many, many ways and may distract us from this notion of making a genuine change. So personally, I would say to you, the time is now. Never before have we had such opportunity, such a base of science to work from, and such willingness, willingness across the field, across the state, across our institutions to make a change. Will we dare to do this? Not just tinker. Will we really take some risks? And do we have the emotional stamina to withstand all the naysayers? Are we ready to make the impossible possible? Thank you all very much. <laughs>